Hello, Tash. It is wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, well, I'm really it's... excited to dive in and explore your kind of journey as a creative entrepreneur today. So welcome. Well, thank you. And I'm glad we were able to make it work with time differences and time zones for sure. <laughs> absolutely. International connections for the win, I'd say. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, what your brand is, what you create, and uh, yeah, a little bit about your your business and how, how you're working with that? Sure. Uh, my name's Tosh or Natasha. I live in Kodiak, Alaska. So it's an island in the Gulf of Alaska. So it's remote, it's rural, um, but I am all about color. I'm all about watercolors. I'm all about collages, which I think can be an interesting conversation to have with you and your crowd with quilting. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love to do things with paper. I like to meet the people who buy my work. I like to do in-person events. Um, just recently did a little foray into teaching that I can tell you about. Fantastic. That sounds really super exciting. So primarily your products are paper goods and you're selling them primarily uh, in person or do you sell them online? Do you ship? Do you distribute? What, what's kind of, um, you know, kind of holistic overview of your business? Sure. Well, obviously pre-COVID in-person events were super easy. Um, and that's where I got my start locally, small, um, getting to know people. Then I do have a website. I sell a lot online um, and it's really fun to ship it out because it gets to go all over the country and sometimes around the world. Um, I do note cards. I do calendars. I do posters, wrapping paper. Um, I have gotten into surface design in a small way. So that also relates back to quilting. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. But I have to say, I do love in-person events and I think that can be, um, challenging for some people, right? So it's an, it's an angle of it that I do enjoy. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, and what's it like being in kind of, I have this perception of Alaska and maybe this is incorrect. So please do correct me if it's wrong, but it's quite isolated. And I am imagining quite a limited number of people live in Alaska. So how do you do, you do in-person events only in Alaska locally, or do you do in-person events outside of Alaska? How do you, you know, how do you find an audience that's big enough to support you? Well, Alaskans are really supportive of the arts and people um, in small rural communities tend to be really, it's, I'm amazed, right? I'm, I'm really grateful of the support, but I do worry about my audience being too small, right? And I do want to grow my online audience so that I can reach people in other places. But Alaska does have tourism and that brings people through our town. Um, we are also a Coast Guard town so that means every two to three years people are cycling through so um they bring people you know people want to visit alaska so somebody moves here all of their friends and family come so there is a chance for me to meet people who live off island and continue to keep them in my orbit um wow yeah, that's amazing yeah. that's such a yeah i mean i'm kind of in the digital space so i'm always thinking about how do i connect with people digitally but, you know, that, you know, in person, meeting them and having that cycle of flow of people kind of moving through your your orbit as well. That's a really uh, different way to think about the connection and audience as well. So it's really a unique take on that. Amazing yeah. to hear about. Yeah. What made you decide to become a creative entrepreneur? Like go back to the beginning here. Tell us a little bit about how did you get into watercolor? How did you get into art and how did it trans translate into a business for you? Sure. Well, it's been, um, bumpy is the wrong word. Like it's been a back and forth path, right. To get here. My background is in, well, I have a background in linguistics. I have a background in printmaking. I have a little bit of a background in art history. And I think like, I've always been creative. And I think a lot of us say that, oh, I've always been a little arty. I've always been a little creative. I started small. I think I was afraid, you know, to take too big of a leap. Uh, I don't have a background in business, so it started with small in-person events or making things for friends and family. And I'd say about 10 years ago, I got serious about the local event angle of my art business. And then it's slowly become more and more uh, focused the last couple of years. Like, how can I make this a business? Uh, how do I keep people in my orbit? How do I build an audience? And then, and I've, I've built my, the wholesale angle of my business. So not only am I 
selling to like you in person at an event, but then I'm also trying to build businesses that carry my work around the state. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it, it it comes in fits and starts. Life has a way of coming in and either interrupting or redirecting. Um, so it's it's I think it's important to take into account what we have accomplished and just stop periodically and say, you know, two years ago, I didn't know how to do this. Or, mm -hmm. you know, two months ago, I didn't know how to do this. And look what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also taking, you know, like life, as you said, does have a way to kind of interrupt us if you want. But um being in this life as a creative entrepreneur that allows us almost that flexibility to say okay well I'm just going to flex with life now for this phase and then I know that I'm going to be able to come back to this at a later time as well so that kind of uh, longer term flexibility I think as well is pretty important maybe something that people don't necessarily consider as a creative entrepreneur as well it doesn't have to be well, and I think linear path right right I, well and I have to say like listening to the interview that you did with Anne or or listening to, to other people, um, I always worry about my time management and my efficiency of my use of time, but it does come from raising a kid or having another part-time job or having life, you know, show up that we have to pivot all the time. And I think it's easy for us to um, be hard on ourselves about that. Like, oh, I didn't put enough time in today when we need to look at the whole picture. Like what else did we do with our day or our week? Yeah, absolutely. That's so true. And being creatives as well, I think we forget that most of the time we're on, we're almost on all of the time. So we're always gathering inspiration somehow. We're always thinking about what we're going to be creating or we're always thinking about the business. So there's never really any off time almost. So really, even if you're not consciously working, you're probably working anyway, you know what I mean? And I don't mean that as in a, you know, we work 24 hours a day kind of gung-ho type of a way, but just in a way that the reality is when you run your own business and you're creative, you're almost always gathering information about something. So in a way, we're always working, really. Well, I'm, I'm always amazed at what I solve when I go for a walk. I'm like, oh, like all these ideas are generated or solutions come up and you know, I don't want to be the person like talking into my phone, like, you know, to, like record my ideas. But sometimes I think like, this is why you put like a little notebook in your pocket because you're out there kind of clearing your mind and everything starts, starts coming. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a really embarrassing slash funny story. Today I was out walking and I'm normally one of those people who are super aware of their surroundings when I'm walking, because I'm like, oh, who are these people crossing the road? They're not even looking. They're always on their phones. And today I had one of those moments. I was listening to something and all of a sudden I had all these ideas. So I had to start texting them down to myself. And I look like one of those maniacs staring at my phone. Somebody nearly backed out of their driveway and ran me over today because I was too busy <laughs> getting my ideas down. <laughs> so I can totally relate to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember any kind of a specific type of um, a catalyst that really started you on this journey of creative entrepreneurship? Like, what was that moment when you said, you know what, I'm going to start to sell my artwork. This is, I'm going to do this. This is going to become a business for me. Was there a kind of a moment like that for you or something that kind of sparked you to make that step? Well, it was a really slow roll to get here. I've been surrounded by... Um, incredibly professional artists in terms of like they're not reproducing their work on note cards or prints they're not interested in surface design they are selling large canvases for large dollar amounts and it took me a really long time to be able to say you know what I want to sell a five dollar note card right like I want my art to be accessible for people mm -hmm. and like I want art to be accessible and I think it really does dictate some of my price range mm -hmm. and it dictates uh, how quickly maybe I want to move from painting to product or small icons that I paint to a product. Um, but it's been it, it, like it took a while for me to be able to accept that I wanted to build my business around retail products. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, don't, I don't think there was like a big like waking up and I <laughs> like I'm going to start a retail empire. It was yeah. more like this is kind of it's it's the jobs I had in the summer in high school and college. I love yeah. working with shops, but I knew I did not want the responsibility of a brick and mortar. Yeah. 
Yeah. And this is kind of a lifestyle really gives you that flexibility to be able to have that business aspect, but not to have any of those overheads, which is, you know, incredible, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a huge question. You know, we as creatives, we have a lot of creative ideas and then we have a lot of business responsibilities. How do you balance that creativity uh, with all of the other demands that you have of running a business? You know, how do you protect your creative time? Well, I'm doing it fairly poorly at the moment. <laughs> so um, <Ditto>. I think <laughs> um, I have some things that do provide structure in my life. So I have, I do teach at adult education, not connected to my art business at all. Mm -hmm. And that does structure my week. Um, but then I find that my non-adult education days can get sucked into a variety of things, whether it's just sort of daily drudgery of like, you know, I need to vacuum at some point. Um, so I'm trying to be better about making chunks of time. I know I'm productive in the morning. So I'm learning to like turn the notifications off on the phone or block it the night before. Like these are the things I'm going to accomplish during that chunk of time. And then know in the afternoon, maybe that's when I'm going to run to the bank or visit my mom or, you know, take care of some other thing that might seem tedious or a daily life thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. How do you go about planning your week? Do you do it kind of day by day or are you kind of more of a weekly or even a quarterly, monthly, what kind of um, planning type of person are you? <laughs> well, I'm changing how I plan because I've noticed like the creative part of me is less of a planner and then learning to turn this into a business requires that I have plans. So I do try to break my year into four, four chunks, right. Into my quarters because both with tourism and with holidays, nice. right. That really dictates certain things in the year. So I know I'm looking at my calendar on the wall over there. <laughs> I know that in June and July, I need to finish up the artwork for the calendar. I will sell in October. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, yeah. but learning that June, July is calendar time mm -hmm. and it's not like October 30th is not calendar time. Like that's when it needs yeah. to be printed and ready to sell. Yeah. Um, so I guess thinking about the audience to this interview, like whatever folks are doing, like what is different about your year? Mm -hmm. The retail year might be different than quilt show calendar of the year yeah, right exactly. so yeah like when do events happen for you when is a selling season for you or a teaching season for you or a doing season for you mm -hmm. yeah. and then I would say on the weekly the weekly basis like I know in April I have a show coming up here locally so that's going to dictate my next month and a half and when I need to get things printed when I need to get things packaged Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a great way to kind of work back. So schedule, put the kind of big rocks in place and schedule those out and then work backwards from those and decide, you know, what are those daily tasks or the, what are those weekly kind of checkoffs that I need to have in order to be ready for those, for those deadlines, whether they're shows or whether they're, you know, um, you know, print deadlines or other things like that. Yeah. That's or great. even taking classes, right? Like I love taking classes. Mm -hmm. I would be a full-time student all of the time. And, and, but that also uses an enormous amount of time. So how to balance taking a class versus mm -hmm. doing your own artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I would say it's, um, it's a struggle. I do better certain times of the year than I do other times of the year. Um, and I think we're all pretty hard on ourselves and like, let's acknowledge what we've accomplished, even though it might not be everything that we want to accomplish. It's really interesting that you mentioned that you have kind of different seasons throughout the year, not only in terms of the retail, I find that I have different kind of um, almost kind of energy seasons throughout the year. So there's some seasons where I'm like really on, I'm really like mentally focused or really creatively focused. And they kind of fluctuate throughout the year. Like I've learned that summertime for me I'm a I'm a wreck like I don't do well with the heat so I don't want to be sitting in front of the computer I'm distracted all the time I don't do a lot of good work in the summertime so understanding those seasonalities of my own kind of creative flow or even my own business flow as well that kind of comes in does that does living in a place like Alaska where you do have such extreme uh, seasons like physical seasons does that really impact on your creative work or on your business work as well? Like, does that shift those cycles for you? Absolutely. So as you were saying that I was saying like summer is productive for me because we have longer days. So 
Um, I'm on an island in the Gulf, so it's very maritime. So the weather comes and goes, it shifts all the time. Snow, rain, sun, rain, fog. Like it's not the quintessential snow on the ground, Alaska stereotype that people might have. But in the summer in Kodiak, like it's phenomenal. And so when we get those like sunny, you're going to laugh, like sunny 65 degree days. <laughs> like yeah, I want to be outside. <laughs> I want to be outside. I want to be up a mountain. And it is so inspiring, right? That then I do come home and I do work and it's irregular, right? Like it's not um, work from nine to 10 in the morning. I might just stop whatever I'm doing and, and paint because I have good daylight and I've seen beautiful things and I want to get it on paper. Yeah. Amazing. Having that, having that external inspiration from seasons, it's, it's yeah. pretty powerful. Yeah. But again, I think a theme of, of what you and I are saying, whether it's the calendar, a retail calendar or a personal calendar or a seasonal calendar is that makes us unlike other people and to sort of embrace that we're going to do things in fits and starts and embrace that we're going to have really creative seasons and then we're going to be depleted by that and we need to somehow like rejuvenate ourselves and yeah look at that as a strength instead of like, oh, dang, I, I don't fit in the norm, you know, so. Exactly, exactly. I think it's two things from that. You know, I think it's really important to also schedule those rejuvenation, those rest periods, because we do know that we kind of go full out. So say, for example, in your case, when you're super creatively switched on in summer, really inspired and things like that, I don't know what happens next, but you might go into a bit of more of a lull and then, you know, you think, okay, well, I need to schedule in that lull time too, or that recuperation time, that recovery time. And then the second thing that I was going to say about that as well was that idea that you have to be always you know, I'm a hundred percent for being consistent. And that for me means showing up, being committed to what I'm committed to doing, but it doesn't necessarily be mean being, you know, like constant the whole time. The energy level doesn't have to be constant the whole time. So I have high energy levels and I have lower energy levels. So I'm kind of really on, or I'm kind of medium on, or I'm kind of off instead of, you know, always kind of medium on, you know what I mean? That mm. constancy is, is kind of, I don't think that's real. I don't think that's even real for other people, let alone creatives. I don't think that's even real for uh, normal, normal people, right. <laughs> non-creative <laughs> entrepreneurs. Like I think, I think the 40 hour work week, this kind of myth around you have to be, you know, nine to five every day, constantly the same. You have to always show up the same way, blah, blah, blah. Reality is nobody is like that. Men, women, Right. You have different things happening in your life. It's impossible to be exactly the same every single day for 365 days a year. So well, that it, constancy is, I think that's a total myth for anyone. Well, and I think it, it sort of promotes like the hamster on the hamster wheel where, where people just can't like take a breath or take a break. And so I've told myself, like, I'm going to have days and weeks where I am the hamster on the hamster wheel, but I know it will end and there will be that lull to sort mm -hmm. of get you know excited about things again so, yeah exactly so. exactly totally yeah what's uh some advice that you would give someone who is starting out as the as a creative entrepreneur you know what's something that they could do to um either protect their creative time or you know some kind of advice for somebody starting out on this path what's something that you wish you had have known about time time management that kind of vein when you first started out as a creative well, I think there are two angles to it that I really didn't understand. Like I understood the paper and the paint and the art end of it. And I even understood the retail part of it because I, I did that as a job, you know, like I knew how to set up a display or interact with people. I didn't know um, the importance of setting up kind of boring, but good systems so that I'm not reinventing the wheel. Uh, not reinventing the wheel for tax season, which is upon us in the US right now, or reinventing the wheel for keeping track of my sales or reinventing the wheel on, you know, an artist statement or a bio, like to make systems for things. And my struggle right now is a system for saving all of the files, all the digital files for all of these things. Um, yeah. But I think it feels boring. Like I wanted to just 
make happy products and sell them. I didn't <laughs> want to build a system. <laughs> sure. So that would be something I would suggest to creative people is work in time to build very simple systems that can keep you moving forward. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I'm sure you've seen a payoff from your systems, which means you can have more time for your creativity because you're not spending time searching for that file or looking for all of the files that you need to file your taxes or, you know, because you've got that system in place. So really you're saving time uh, up, you know, you're not saving time up front because you're spending the time to set up the systems, but you're saving time in the long run because those systems that are in place, the next iteration are going to save you so much more time. But it is really hard to to accept that, right? And say, I have to invest the time now to get the time saving later because we, you know, as humans, we, we are like immediate um, reward type of humans, people. Yeah. Uh, it's our kind of mechanism, right? So yeah, I totally agree on the systems. And I try to do systems while I'm doing something. I try to record what my uh, kind of steps are so that next time I do it, I don't have to sit down and do the system. I'm doing it con contemporaneously with the task that I'm working on. And that seems to be kind of useful as well. Yeah. Mm. And I yeah. think, and again, it, it evolves. And I think to give ourselves space and grace that, that we will evolve our systems and we'll evolve our businesses and we'll evolve. I mean, our art will evolve as well. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. What's one piece of tech that's absolutely essential in your business now? So this could be like hardware, this could be an app or some software or something that you use. What's something that you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I ever did it without this. You know what? Super basic scanner from a big box store. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, <laughs> um, I am still creating on paper. I love the the ritual of creating hard copy on paper. And then I do need to digitize that. And yeah. scanning is the way to do it. I have a love-hate relationship with both Photoshop elements and Adobe Illustrator. They do amazing things for me, but I have barely scratched the surface, mm. um, but it's that scanner it, that allows me to go anywhere with my art. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's so key, especially if you're trying to scale that kind of um, uh, real world art, you know, that, uh, what am I trying to say? Physical art as opposed to digital art. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. What's one of the biggest aha moments you've had as a creative entrepreneur? Is there something you're just like, this is clicking now this all of a sudden, you know, the clouds parted and I'm like, oh, yes, this is this is what this is about. You know what I think, because um, this something else a minute ago made me think of this, too. Like, it sounds a little corny. It's not it, like it, you need to believe in yourself, like the things that make you happy about your art. Like, that's what you need to be doing with your art. And it's yeah. easy when we take classes and we're sort of little voyeurs into how other creative entrepreneurs are doing things that we think, oh, well, I need to do that. And I need to do that. And I need to do that. And really, like, if you can take a quiet moment and think about, like, just what just makes you get up and, and get your art supplies out, then that's what you need to be doing. So I think if we flip it around to you and quilting, I don't know much about quilting. So in my head, I have a stereotype of what one might do, but like what like drives you to do what you do with quilting or what drives you to do what you do with teaching. That's um, that was my aha moment was like to sort of quit listening to the noise and take what I need and, and just keep going with it. Absolutely. And when you get into these kind of busy moments because you're trying to run a business and grow a business and do all of the things, sometimes it's really actually easy to forget why are you doing all of this in the first place, especially if, you know, that creative time that you have has been eaten away by all of the other tasks. It can feel really hard to remember what the real purpose behind all of this was in the first place. So that's amazing advice. Yeah, really tapping back into that kind of core, the core purpose ultimately is to you know, enjoy this work that we're making and bring joy to other people through that. And that's, that's something that sometimes it sounds ridiculous, but it's easy to forget sometimes that that's really what this is about. Mm. Absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, just like when I could finally admit that I just wanted to make paper products, <laughs> everything became easier. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Staying true, staying true to your, Thank you. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Is there any kind of specific advice that you would like to share with somebody who's starting out as a creative entrepreneur or anything that you think creative entrepreneurs just really need to know? Find your people, find your people. So I live on an island in the Gulf of Alaska and then we had COVID and um, I had just joined a membership where, you know, you pay a particular fee for a larger program and then they break you into little groups, right? So the Alaskans and the Hawaiians always get grouped together because of the time zone. So I found myself once a month meeting with women in Hawaii. And then our membership thing ended and we kept meeting. We're like, this is awesome. Like see you next month. And so for two and a half years, I have met online with a group of women who are creative entrepreneurs, teachers, um, artists of in many different media, um, age range of 32 to 71. And we just met in person in January for an art amazing. retreat. It amazing. It was amazing. And like I had to find my people because I'm sitting here by myself on an island <laughs> and I have people locally, you know, I have my friend groups. I have my, my local people as well, but this was something larger and stronger. And we were a mentor. It was like, we were all mentoring each other Mm. through personal crises, through art and entrepreneur crises, like all of it was in this group of five women. Amazing. Yes. It is so important to find your people. It can be a pretty lonely path. You know, I'm the same. We work from home. We we work in a studio. Um, creative work is often you either alone or you need to work alone, or that's kind of like your modus operandi for creating. So being able to say, okay, now it's time for me to sit down. I'm going to connect with these people, whether that's in real life or, or digitally. It's so critical because it's very easy to get caught up in your head and your headspace and not have that kind of, um, you know, grounding uh, connection to external thought processes and even getting someone just to look in on you and say, oh, from my viewpoint, I can see these sorts of things happening, which maybe you can't see from your vantage point. So yeah, incredibly, incredibly helpful to have that supportive group of people. Absolutely. And I yeah. think, you know, Zoom kind of got a bad rap because everything went remote, but I'm remote to begin with. Women on islands in Hawaii are remote to begin with. So yeah. this was actually like a great way for us to meet. We wouldn't have met without it. Right? We wouldn't and have met without it either. We wouldn't have met without it. So <laughs> yeah. time zones, like geographic miles, all of that. Um, I, I think encourage people to find a group and, and maybe the strength is that we're not in the same town. Mm. Maybe that strength is that we're removed from each other and we can come in with very different perspectives. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. So important. Tash, this has been an absolute pleasure. Could you tell me a little bit about the best way for people to reach you if they want to see your products, see your work and get in touch with you? How would they get in touch with you? Sure. I would invite everyone to probably just start with my website. It's Natasha Zahn Studio, which is a little bit of a mouthful. It's the same handle that I use on Instagram. If people are on Instagram, Natasha Zahn Studio. And people can drop me a message or an email. Um, I love to connect with people and answer questions about products I use or resources. So mm -hmm. please uh, know that I'm here. And whether it's watercolor or collage, I think we all have things in common. It comes down to color and composition and how we put things together. Absolutely. And you did mention that you are, are you starting to run some classes. What kinds of classes are you running? Well, so this is my next big, you know, throw it out there in the universe and, and it, I'll manifest it somehow. I did a class locally. It was a line drawing class aimed at teachers um, because I have that background in linguistics and I'm an artist. I love sort of the interplay between line and mark making and literacy. And so I had I developed a series of guides for teachers to get kids to replicate shapes and suddenly have like all of these tide pool creatures that they can color or cut out or collage or, you know, build into 
you know, we, we did book covers and we did, you know, when you put the piece of paper around your head and you staple things on it. So we did um, a lot of fun projects based on line drawing. And I would love to be able to offer that online for people so that, you know, there'd be a little module and then there might be things that people can download. So that's my big 2023, 2024, learn how to do it thing. <laughs> it's out there. It's in the universe. It's going to be coming, coming true, coming real very, very shortly. I love it, Tash. That's absolutely incredible. What an intersection of um, expertise. That's just incredible. Really fascinating. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for your time. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And it's been I'm a joy to, to connect. Sending, mm -hmm. sending some people your way so they can check out your amazing work, your beautiful, colorful work all the way from Kodiak Island in Alaska. Thank you so Excellent. much. Excellent. Thank you. Have a great day. Great evening in Italy. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.